Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter five. Luke chapter five, that's where our, it's our text for tonight. Luke chapter five. Today I want to tell you the story of Jesus' miracle catch. Jesus' miracle catch. A little background before we actually read the passage here. This episode is set early in Jesus' Galilean ministry while He was teaching in the northern part of the country near His home. Now Luke tells us that during this time He was very popular with the people. He wasn't always popular with the people, but during this particular time when this event took place, He was popular. He was also beginning to stir up some anger um, uh, from those who opposed him, mainly the, the established leadership. But the people uh, were very much uh, amazed by him and very much in favor of him. And so it was during this period that he went to Peter's house. Uh, he healed Peter's mother-in-law and all those who were brought to him with various illnesses. You know that story um, takes place during this time period as well. And Luke writes that his ministry grew in numbers as he went teaching from place to place. Now in response to this demand, of course, Jesus would begin to call certain people to be his apostles and train them for ministry. It's only natural. He started by himself, a much larger following, began to follow him. He, he began to recruit people to help him in this ministry. We call them apostles. Now these events lead up to a passage that I'm going to read in Luke chapter five where we see Jesus calling workers into service. And what better place to find those who would gather souls than the shores of Galilee where for centuries men had learned to harvest the sea. What better place to go for harvesters than fishing villages where for a lifetime men were used to harvesting fish. So in Luke chapter 5, the author describes the first among several to be called. Now, we're going to read this passage, but as we do, let's note that this was not the first time that Peter and the others had met Jesus. Sometimes we think, wow, this is the first time they met, and it's not the first time they met. I mean, they were neighbors. They were from the same village. I mean, they lived in the same village with families growing side by side. Peter and his family had heard Jesus' teaching before, probably seen a demonstration of His power. They were already disciples in some way. They were already followers um, in a particular way. But on this day, a very special call was issued by the Lord. A call that helps us see the qualities necessary in a person who would ultimately become a fisher of, a fisher of men. And so this lesson is also about you know, what kind of person becomes a fisher of men. And as we read through the story, um, Luke demonstrates the qualities that are required. Now, let's read uh, beginning in verse uh, one. It says, now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he, meaning Jesus, was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Well, Luke describes the scene. It's very crowded. Jesus is teaching. He's at the edge of the lake while he taught. Not really a good condition to teach. While you're teaching, people are backing you up into the water. And so he sees two empty boats belong to the fishermen uh, returning from a night of fishing, cleaning their nets, finishing up the job. And so Jesus asks Simon, later called Peter, one of these fishermen, to put out from the shore so he can better address the crowd from the boat. A bit like a floating, uh, a floating uh, platform. And so he sat in the boat. That was the style of teaching of the rabbis. They would sit. So he sits in the boat a little further away from shore and he begins and continues his teaching. We continue the story in verse four. It says, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let, uh, let down your nets for a catch. 
Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And so when he's finished uh, teaching the crowd, uh, Jesus tells Peter to go into the deep water and let down his nets for a, a catch of fish. Now it seems very normal here, except this contradicts all the good sense about fishing that was known at the time. The best time to fish is at night, or was at night, or early dawn, not in broad daylight. Uh, the best places are the moderate depth, not the very deep uh, places. And Peter adds that they had tried all night long with great effort and, I might add, experience, uh, in probably all the best places that were known, and they had caught nothing. But in Peter's response, we see one of the basic qualities needed for a person who was to become, as Jesus said, a fisher of men, and that is obedience to the words of Jesus Christ. Think about it for a second. Against all the fishing rules, against the embarrassing stare of the other fishermen on the shore and their fishing partners. Remember, they weren't the only fishermen. The other fishermen were also cleaning their nets, had been out at night. They're looking out there and they're saying, what is that crazy fool doing? He's going back out. He's going, what? Even against his very sore and tired body, I mean, he had already worked all night. They had cleaned everything for the next night's fishing. What does Peter say? He says, at your bidding, I will let down my nets. In other words, your words command my will. I will do what you say, even if it goes against all the conventional wisdom that I have as, an fisherman, as a fisherman. So those who would fish for men need to first of all be absolutely dedicated to obedience to Christ's word before any other influence. And there's a good reason for this. Winning souls is not a human effort accomplished through man's wisdom, but rather it is accomplished through the power of the gospel. Romans chapter 1, 16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And he answers his own question. Why not, Paul? Because it is the power of God unto salvation. God's power unto salvation. Winning souls is not a human effort accomplished through man's wisdom, but it is accomplished through the foolishness of preaching, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 21. It's not a logical thing, it's not a, the strength of your argument, the quality of your oratory. It is the foolishness of preaching. Imagine <coughs> preaching a resurrected Savior, one who was murdered and uh, uh, nailed to a tree. This is the one that we're offering up to the world as its savior, to the wise in the world, to the ones who think they know everything. We're saying to them, really the answer is this man 2,000 years ago that we believe is God and ended up being killed by the Roman, uh, the Roman uh, army. This is the foolishness of preaching. That's how we win souls. And it is accomplished by people who know nothing except Christ and Him crucified, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Only fools for Christ catch men for Christ. And Peter demonstrated his foolishness by obeying Jesus against all the odds on that day. And so another quality of fishers of men, the first one is um, obedience to God's word. The second quality for those who want to be fishers of men a clear sense of their own sinfulness. You know, you'd think the answer would be, well, great knowledge in philosophy and history and archaeology, you know, they really got to know all this stuff by heart, but actually fishers of men have to know first and foremost how sinful they are. Let's keep reading and we'll see how Luke develops that idea. Uh, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and they filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. 
But when Simon Peter saw that, he, uh, when, when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Imagine, Peter's faith was rewarded by a tremendous catch that even both boats could not hold. In the most unlikely place, in the most unlikely time when experts had failed, they catch an incredible amount of fish and this at the simple word of Jesus. Wait a minute now, Jesus, the carpenter's son. Not the fisherman's son. Not a fellow fisherman. He was a carpenter. What does he know about fishing? And yet at his word, they make a tremendous catch. So Peter had heard Jesus teach. I mean, he was probably there. You know, he's cleaning his nets. Jesus is teaching the people. He heard the lesson. He heard what he's saying. He's already a believer. He had seen the other healings, even his own mother-in-law, and the miracles too. But this particular one, you know how something just happens to you in your life? The timing is just right. This particular miracle done in his own boat, within his own profession, somehow strikes home all of the things that previously were said and done by Jesus and it drives Peter to his knees in recognition of his own unworthiness before the Lord. You know how it is? How many of us have been in church We've heard, a, we've heard a, a hundred, a thousand sermons. And then all of a sudden, one day, the preacher, the teacher, says something and somehow, like a lightning strike, it just pierces us to the heart. How many times have we seen people just come forward and just say, you know, I, I need to confess this sin, or I need to accept the Lord and be baptized, or I need to make my life right, or you know, a thousand sermons before, nothing, and then all of a sudden, boom. Well, that's what happened to Peter. All of a sudden, it all comes together for him. Now in this we see the second important quality of a good fisher of men, and that is a clear sense of one's own unworthiness before Jesus. You know, the Lord's messengers and servants had, all of them had this common sensitivity, or most of them had it anyways. Moses, did Moses feel really good about you know, listening to the Lord and going to Pharaoh, did he say, boy, am I ever glad you chose me? Because I'm up for this. No, Moses would say, no, not me, Lord. I, I can't do that. Are you kidding? I can't even speak. I don't, what will I say? What will I do? Send somebody else. How about Isaiah? I mean, Isaiah, an educated man. Many scholars believe he was a, from a priestly uh, clan. Uh, he, was, he had access to the king. So he was high in power and intelligence and so on and so forth. And yet when he comes before the Lord, what happens? He said, oh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm dirty, he said. I I'm dirty. And Paul, how does Paul describe himself when he bothers even to refer to himself? He says, I'm not just a sinner. I'm the chief sinner, I'm the worst of all. This is coming from a man who had established churches, who had heard the Lord speak to him, who had written you know, inspired writings, who performed miracles, who raised the dead. You know, he did all of these things and then when he goes around to describe himself, what does he say? I'm no good, I'm a sinner, I'm full of sin. A clear image of one's own sinfulness allows a person to glory in the marvelous grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ. This insight spurs us on to do the will of God with joy. You know how it works? You say to God, really, you're choosing me, Lord, to do this work? I'm no good, I'm not worthy of this. And he says, yeah, I'm choosing you, you, follow me. And then your brain says, he chose me. Me, I don't even think highly of me. And yet he chose me to do this work. And if he thinks I can do this work, I go to it with joy. It's what Paul refers to when he wrote in, um, uh, what is it, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 15, 
uh, verses nine and 10. He says, for I am, listen, for I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle. That's not false humility here. You know, when people say, wow, I really like that dress or I really like your new suit or whatever, and you go, nah, this old thing, nah. This is not false humility here. He's, he's telling the truth. He says, I'm not fit to be called an apostle because why? He said, I persecuted the church. And persecuted here, we know that Paul didn't just you know, say bad things about the church. He went in and he dragged Christians out of their homes and he threw them in jail. And was responsible for the imprisonment and quite possibly the death, the execution of many Christians. He said, I, I don't deserve to serve the Lord. I don't deserve to be a fisher of men. Look what I did. But then listen to what he says in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Well, what is he? Well, I am saved, that's what I am. I am righteous, that's what I am. I am forgiven, that's what I am. How? By the grace of God, he says. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. It's what Jesus was explaining to the Pharisees who questioned the propriety of a prostitute washing and drying his feet with her tears and her hair. When he says to these men, he who is forgiven little loves little. Jesus was trying to show them that unless they saw their own sinfulness clearly, they would never recognize their need for Him and consequently experience His love for them and their love for Him, and they could never love sinners either. If you, don't, if you cannot recognize how miserable you are as a sinner, you'll never be able to love others who are sinners too. Why? Because if you can't see your own sins, you, 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 you can't, you can't you know, extend the grace of God for others. Peter's heart was broken open by this miracle and he saw his own sinful reflection in the shining mirror of Christ's power and his perfection, and he was afraid. He was afraid. Oh, please, just, why don't you just leave now, okay? I'm just a shriveled up bug at the bottom of the boat, that's what I am. I'm not worthy of you, just leave me alone. And although it may have been painful at the time, this humble recognition of Christ's lordship and his own personal unworthiness was to be a second valuable asset for one who was to become a skilled catcher of men. And so, who are the fishers of men? Now, they're the ones who are ready to obey Christ at his word. They're the ones who really get it, who really understand the depth of their own sinfulness. And they're the ones who are prepared to make not just a commitment, an absolute commitment. Let's keep reading in Luke chapter five, shall we? Verse 10, uh, as I was reading the bottom, of the, uh, the bottom of the verse, Jesus said to Simon, do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now check Peter out, what's going on with Peter. He's absolutely paralyzed. He's paralyzed. His life is revealed. He is in shock because of the miracle and because of the fatigue and because of the crowd. He can't go forward, he can't go back. The, 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 the self-realization for what he is really freezes him. He just wants Jesus to leave him there in his paralysis. And Jesus reassures him not to be afraid. How, how do I know that Peter was afraid? Because Jesus said, don't be afraid. And so he was afraid. What was he afraid of? Well, he was afraid of dying in his sins. He was afraid of his helpless state. What am I going to do now? He forces him to make a decision. 
now that he has come to recognize the truth about himself, a decision that we all have to make when this happens to us. He gives him a choice to stay paralyzed or to follow him into the work of the kingdom. And Peter responds. And in this we see the third indispensable quality for good fishermen, absolute commitment to the call. Peter and others, they leave everything, the boats, the fish, the nets, the people. You know, we say, well, is that very responsible? He had a family, they took over. They left immediately. When the call came, they wasted no time. When Jesus calls you, you think like he's got time for you? If he bothers to give you the call to come into some form of ministry, does he say, yeah, well, this is for three years from now? They followed the Lordship and the direction of Jesus. They did it immediately and they left everything behind. For the next several years, they and others were called and in every case documented, they left everything and followed Jesus with single-minded determination, except one. And that was the rich young ruler. Jesus called the rich young ruler. He said, hey, sell everything, give to the poor and come, he said, follow me. I mean, you realize what's happening here? Come follow a personal face-to-face -face invitation by the Lord Himself. Come, He says, follow me. How sad that is, that's so sad. The things that awaited that young man, the things he could have seen and done in the Lord's name. And it said he was sad because he had many, many possessions. Those who would be fishers of men don't look back at their sins. They don't look back at their old lives. They don't look back at their successes or their failures. They concentrate on fishing for men and that is all they need to do. I think there are two major lessons in this story, just 11 verses. The first, is a description of the qualities necessary for being a good fisher of men. Those who have a calling, for example, to minister or to preach or to lead in some way in the church or to serve, they need to examine themselves carefully to see if they possess, not diplomas, not easy speech. You know, I used to, you know, I, every once in a while I teach a class for young preachers out at OC about communications and all that kind of stuff, and I tell them, if you're going into the ministry because you like public speaking, no. Uh, go, go learn how to be a weatherman or do, you know, sell insurance or something. You know? I mean, if, what, if public speaking is the thing that's driving you to go into ministry, you're not going to make it. Because the public speaking part takes you know, 25 minutes a week or so. You better love people. You better love souls. You better love to study. You better love to examine yourself before the Lord. You better be ready to repent, not just one time before you're baptized. You better be ready to repent every day. Expect to repent. Expect it as a lifestyle. Those who are called in ministry, they need to carefully see if they possess a willingness to obey Jesus at His word, a readiness to go against opposition and embarrassment, conventional wisdom and tradition in order to simply and humbly do what Jesus says, period. They need sensitivity towards their own sinfulness, a clear conscious awareness of our unrighteousness helps us appreciate the cross and have compassion for those who are sinners like ourselves. I've had people come to me, as most ministers do, to confess their sins because their sins have gotten them in trouble or they've embarrassed themselves or they're out of, you know, they're, they're out of control. I don't know, whatever it is, con consumption of some you know, some stuff, whatever it's drugs or pornography or they've stolen or they've lied or they've just done an ugly, embarrassing thing. And I always tell them, you know, go ahead, give it a shot. I guarantee you, you're not going to tell me anything I haven't heard before. Why? 
Because it's the same sins from all, from, from time immemorial. It's the same sins over and over again. People lie, they cheat, they harm themselves. They do the same stuff. When we're aware of it in ourselves, that's when we begin to see how wonderful, how gracious, how good the cross is. But until we get there, you know, this is just a symbol over here. And this passage also reminds us that if one, to be, if one is to be a good fisherman, a fisherman he, must have, he must leave all in order to follow Christ. No looking back, no hesitation, no struggle between serving two masters. You know, many believed in Jesus that day. You know, remember, he was teaching people on the shore. A lot of people believed in Jesus that day. And what did they do after he was finished? They returned to their nets in search for fish. And then others left everything to become fishers of men. So that's one of the lessons. What does it take? What does it take to be a fisher of men? And then there's another broader lesson, if you wish, in this passage. A lesson that includes all of us. Maybe the first one about fisher of men, you know, aims at individuals who are going into some sort of ministry or leadership or preaching. You know, it's kind of tightly focused, but there's a second lesson that is much broader. And that's the lesson of the miracle catch. And the lesson of the miracle catch is this. Jesus will provide the catch if we're willing to fish. Jesus will provide the catch if we are willing to fish. So many times we won't try to do something to win souls or to serve in the church, or to encourage others, or to grow in faithfulness, purity, or knowledge because of what other people will think. Sometimes you know, people won't step up to leadership position or step up to a greater sense of service or responsibility because they don't want people to think, well, who do you think he is? Well, or she is, What's this? what happened? They're, they're, following, they're volunteering to be in charge. Well, who does she think she, she is? Never mind that business. We don't try to do something to win souls because somebody else might <laughs> criticize us. Or sometimes there's resistance from family or others in and out of the church. What's he do? I remember when I first became a Christian, people, you know, my, my family said, well, you know, it's a fad. Nah, I give him two years. It's a fad. You know, people go through that. They go through the, they used to say, his religious kick. He's having a religious kick. You know, people do that sometimes. Two years, he'll be, he'll be back to his old self. <laughs> you should have seen what they said when I decided to quit my job and go into ministry. Then they were like, whoa, let's call the ambulance. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we're afraid because of our perceived lack of resources. Oh, we can't do that, not enough money. We can't do that, not enough time, not enough people, not enough knowledge, not enough strength to overcome sin. Satan always provides an excuse for not doing what we should do. Always, always. Be ready for it. But the story of the miracle catch teaches us that if we just get our nets into the water, Jesus would provide the catch, and more often than not, a catch much bigger than we can handle. So I ask you a question. Where are you this evening? Where are you this evening? Are you in the boat with Peter, casting your nets into the deep waters of faith? Or are you standing on the shore of fear and disbelief? Where are you? Are you in the boat or are you on the shore? If Jesus asked us personally to be baptized, would we do it? If Jesus asked us personally to give up that bad habit, would we do it? If Jesus asked us personally to become more involved or more faithful to the church, would we do it at His word? And if Jesus told us to let our nets down by stepping out in faith, 
If He told us to let our nets down by stepping up and giving, or doing the thing we know we ought to do, or sharing our faith with someone new, would we lower our nets into those deep waters? You see, these things are risky. They're out of our comfort zone. They move us out of our safety area. But I tell you, I tell you that even if you did half of these things, just half of them, you would see what a miracle catch looks like in your own life. Because as I've said before, Jesus will provide the catch if we'd only let down our nets. Please listen to the Lord if He is calling you tonight to let down your nets. And if you need to respond to Him simply by coming forward and asking for prayer or confessing His name to be baptized, or maybe throughout the week in your own personal life, making the decision to do better, act better, pray more, read your, whatever it is. If you're ready to let down your nets, then Ask the Lord to help you this night as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.